Okay, can everyone hear me okay? All right. Good evening. Um, Dave Fabi, coming from uh, San Diego, California. So I'm going to be talking about Verilast technology. It's 20 years of clinical legacy and tribological excellence, and that's oxinium. So why oxinium? What was, the, what was the reason behind and what was the drive to develop this type of technology? One, we saw some wear issues with cobalt chromium. Um, abrasive and oxidative wear does roughen cobalt chromium, as shown here in these uh, slides, uh, in the pictures uh, to the left on that slide. Whether it's bone cement, bone, fretting debris, or actually shed ingrowth particles, and it was clinically observed that scratches can increase the wear. So we wanted to avoid and potentially address some of these pitfalls. So what is the process of uh, developing this oxinium? What it is, it's a rot zirconium alloy that is heated in air. The surface transforms to a stable ceramic. And Smith and Nephew will uh, tell you uh, that they don't like to use the coated terminology. It's uh, the surface actually transforms, so it's not a ceramic coating. Very important distinction. So what happens, it's uh, oxygen is diffused on the original surface. It becomes the stable ceramic as shown in the slide as it goes through. And you get a uniform ceramic oxide layer. Oxide is durable and low friction with the toughness of metal. So you get the advantages, the good advantages of both uh, essentially a ceramic and a cobalt chrome metal alloy. So, what this technology does, and it's been shown uh, by Ezit, one of my colleagues in San Diego at Scripps, so that's my, uh, my area, my neck of the woods, is that this reduces the wear rate from 40 up to 90% with non-irradiated polyethylene. This testing includes typical and severe conditions, so under smooth conditions, as shown here, the oxidized zirconium had a uh, much less wear rate than that of uh, traditional uh, polyethylene and uh, traditional cobalt chrome. Uh, also shown here in a rough situation that uh, the wear was much less. So what this surface is, um, this, uh, this, this surface uh, is, is it has uh, improved durability over passive oxide. It's over 400 times thicker than that of cobalt chrome passive oxide. There's a brick-like structure, as uh, shown in that picture there, uh, perpendicular to the surface. Furthermore, with regards to reduced friction, it attracts joint fluids better than that of metals. So resistance, there's less resistance with sliding against polyethylene compared to cobalt chrome. And this graph there, the bar graph, demonstrates such. Reduces abrasion by bone cement, by uh, uh, a factor of uh, 4,900 by 4,900 times. Post-test roughness is over 160 times. This represents uh, 10 years of cement debris within the joint. So all very good advantages. In terms of strength, one condyle was able to support 4.4 kilonewtons, which equates to uh, 1,000 foot-pounds. Furthermore, it does not shatter with 89 kilonewtons or 10 tons load on a head in terms of the hip. The oxide thickness is uh, uniform, even on complex shapes, much like that of cobalt chromium designs. So finally, in summary, yeah. okay. Sorry. Okay, sorry. thank you, apologize about that. So uh, in summary, what are your oxidized zirconium advantages? I alluded to this to before. So it wears like a ceramic by resisting uh, roughness, uh, resist roughening. There's less friction. But it's a metal device, so you don't have that uh, concern about brittle or fracture as you do in a purely ceramic zirconium head. The designs are proven, and uh, flexibility uh, is seen uh, surgically with an extra benefit. There's excellent biocompatibility with reduced potential, potential for metal ion concerns, as we learn from metal on metal bearings. There's extensive clinical experience. So the first total knee was done in December of 1997 with over 1.4 million implanted to date. First total hip was in October 2002 with over 400,000 implanted to date. So there's continuing clinical studies with this, so tried and true. 
In terms of survivorship within knees, 10-year minimum results. Uh, here's a study here of uh, 83 patients of the Genesis 2 knee with their CRPS with a almost 98% survivorship with no major complications and improvement of mean, uh, mean knee society scores. Fewer clinical wear fe features, um, as discussed as one of the first slide in terms of uh, cobalt chrome, this produced lower wear scores for both surfaces than cobalt chromium. Retrieved components repaired and matched for time and patient. The femurs had 92% per, uh, percent less clinical wear compared to cobalt chrome, and inserts were 31% less. The retrieved oxidized zirconium heads showed least chemical activity on the taper surface. So, uh, you know, one of, the, one of the buzzwords in our field these days is corrosion. So uh, utilizing this technology, there's less learned for, uh, less concern for taper corrosion and quote unquote tronionosis. In terms of hip simulator tests, uh, again, as discussed, this reduces your wear and your taper fretting corrosion. Cross-link polyethylene reduces the wear rate by 90% compared to cobalt chromium. Oxidized zirconium demonstrates a reduction in wear rate by another 67%, leading to 97% total. In terms of jogging, so I get asked this question a, a lot in terms of uh, patients, and initially we would tell them not to run or jog, but potentially with uh, this technology, uh, that may be less of a concern as shown here with a 32 millimeter cobalt chromium head on a virgin polyethylene, uh, demonstrating um, much less wear rate uh, and comparable to that of uh, ceramic uh, zirconium heads on cross-link polyethylene. Again, this very last HIPS achieved 97% survivorship at 10 years. Low clinical wear rates in HIPS, a uh, study of approximately 370 patients with 32 millimeter heads, five year follow up, penetration rates calculated relative one year radiographs. As you can see here, less than that of cobalt chrome on cross link polyethylene and much less than that of oxidized zirconium. There was a trend, not statistically significant, but however, there was a trending towards that. So, what is Verilast technology? What it does, it combines an oxium. Uh, oxinium, uh, femoral, uh, and or uh, head component as it relates to uh, the total hip or femoral component as it relates to the total knee. And you mate this with highly cross-linked polyethylene, whether it's on the tibia um, polyethylene insert or the liner component on the hip. So this design, cross-linked polyethylene is specifically designed for the knees and the hips and this uh, exhibits low wear characteristics. So, it's been tagged the 30-year knee. So how many cycles represents 30 uh, years of use? Historical standard was uh, one uh, MC per year for elderly patients. Younger, more active patients use their joints more. So activity and age, 63 total hip patients were, uh, were studied with a mean age of 58, uh, range being 27 to 73, with decreasing activity with age as shown here. So the conserved estimate of uh, 45 MCs over 30 years for a 45-year-old patient with an average of 1.5 MCs per year. So Verilast technology and lesion primary knee was tested for 30 years of simulated wear performance. And as you can see here, you got cobalt chromium here on uh, polyethylene with three-year simulation. You can see the wear rates were significant compared to at a 30-year simulation, so increased by a factor of 10, you can see even here the wear rate is uh, much less. So this is uh, why, um, and this study corroborates uh, in, the, in vivo that there's a 30-year performance uh, claim. So what are the advantages that it combines two advanced bearing technologies, your award-winning oxinium material with cross-link polyethylene, specifically designs designed for the demands of the knees and hips, balances the performance uh, needs of the joint, allows flexible demand matching for patients, and ultimately exhibits uh, low wear characteristics. So thank you.
thank you, Dr. Fabi, for a wonderful talk on Oxenium. Uh, I'd like to invite him again uh, for a talk on uh, redefining porosity with Retapt, uh, how stick technology and how the cone lock technology from Smith & Nephew is redefining porosity in hips, SWM hips. Okay, um, so we'll be talking about R3 first with the uh, stick tie technology. This was an implant that was designed, uh, or one of my mentors, Dr. Wayne Goldstein, actually a good friend of mine, helped uh, design uh, this cup itself. So stick tight is an advanced porous titanium coating. So why is this ingrowth technology needed? Conventional ingrowth technologies work well. However, there is opportunity to improve, particularly with uh, initial stability uh, by increased coefficient of friction increased reliability of bone ingrowth, because some studies demonstrate that with standard technologies, uh, ingrowth was approximately 20-30%. Stick tie coating is designed to improve uh, initial implant stability, as was discussed, and uh, again, uh, improve bone ingrowth under challenging conditions. So what are the keys to having successful cementless fixation? Uh, number one is uh, important is stability. So you want your initial short-term stability, you want mechanical fixation uh, as biologic fixation obviously takes some time. So you want a good coefficient of friction, good design with appropriate press fit, adjunct fixation with screws if needed. Your long-term stability relies on biologic fixation as we all know. You want a material that is biocompatible, a good pore and optimal pore structure with uh, a good optimal specific surface area as well. So with regards to stick tight, uh, Advanced ingrowth, uh, it's an advanced ingrowth alternative to conventional porous coating. Compared to traditional conventional porous coating, there's greater friction, so you get better initial stability. There is greater porosity, which uh, leads to uh, potentially uh, increased bone ingrowth extent. And there's a greater surface area, so a higher rate of bone ingrowth. And here's an example of what it looks like uh, under electron microscope. So comparisons, so here in this slide, we're looking at a comparison to spherical bead coatings. Um, so what we see the manufacturing uh, method, they're both conventional sintering as shown here. Porosity is increased to s approximately 62% uh, in stick tight coating compared to 50% in conventional. The pore size is the same. There's a greater surface area on stick tight coating and greater roughness. Here are your sample cross sections as shown here for your spherical bead coating, and then this is your stick tie coating. With regards to friction, um, this was tested against simulated bone. Three coating types were investigated. Stick tie coating, plasma spray titanium coating, titanium bead coating. And these were tested against three types of foam. And what this was is supposed to represent different bone qualities among patients. So you have a low density foam, a medium density foam, and a high density foam. And as you can see here with regards to stick tight, obviously in orange, that's Smith & Nephew's uh, 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 color, you can see here that the coefficient of friction is uh, higher in all uh, density foams. So what you saw is significantly greater friction with stick tight, all bone types. With regards to friction against cancellous bone, which is what we want in total hips, because you know we're getting down to bleeding cancellous bone, so it's important how the friction uh, acts along this type of bone. So you have your standard friction test method along an inclined pane, as shown here. Friction was tested against cortical bone as well as cancellous bone, and stick tight was uh, compared to historic results for a tantalum foam. So what was seen, stick tight coating was comparable to tantalum foam, against cortical bone, but had a greater coefficient of friction against cancellous bone. Again, very important because uh, what we do in total hips, uh, we're primarily going against cancellous bone, ideally, when we're putting in our cups. So to segue that, <clears throat> greater friction was seen against cancellous bone. Here's another study demonstrating that. So five coating types were investigated, titanium bead coating, grit blasted titanium, plasma sprayed titanium coating, tandem of foam, and stick tight coating. So look at the orange here. Stick tight coating had the greatest average coefficient of friction. 
However, it's important to know this was not statistically uh, significant than tansel and foam, but statistically significant against your plasma sprayed good plastic and titanium beads. In terms of uh, performance in vivo in a loaded model, uh, this was in the sheep animal model. Implant was a semicircular disc, as demonstrated here, with porous coating on the top and the bottom. Implantation site was in cancellous bone on the medial side of the proximal tibia, three millimeters below the articular surface, uh, articular surface which was loaded uh, during weight bearing. Finite anal uh, analysis uh, was then done. This is what it looks like. And this is what was seen in terms of bone ingrowth. So you got titanium beads uh, down here, and you got stick tight up top. And what you're seeing here, this is uh, what is being seen at six weeks. This is what's being seen at 26 weeks uh, in both titanium beads as well as stick tight. Um, summary, conclusion, good bone ingrowth was deep into both coatings with no fibrous tissue ingrowth being observed. In terms of long-term stability, Important to know there was no difference in groups at either six weeks or 26 weeks regards to stick tight and titanium beads. So it's good to know that it's not worse in terms of long-term stability. However, this is where the advantage is, initial stability in terms of mechanical fixation. Stick tight was 164% uh, more stable and uh, in terms of initial stability uh, mechanical fixation. So what are the takeaways and the um, conclusions that, and the results uh, and, and the discussion uh, regards to this in vivo study? Stick type provided healthy mineralized bone ingrowth up to six months under loaded conditions with no fibrous tissue seen. It's equivalent or better, uh, equivalent or at least equivalent or potentially better biologic fixation than titanium beads with better initial mechanical fixation. An RSA analysis of stick-tight acetabular shells uh, was, perform was uh, performed here. The study design was a prospective, prospective study compared to historical data for the same shell with the titanium bead coating. Measurements were performed of migrations to three translations, three rotations. Follow-up evaluation was uh, investigated at three months, one year, and two years. As of one year follow-up, in this RSA analysis, the average translations and rotations for stick tight coated shells were lower in almost every plane at minus three months and at one year. So this shows stick tight versus titanium beads in terms of translations. Medial lateral, about the same um, or a little less displacement than that of uh, uh, titanium beads. Much less wide displacement in the proximal distal. Uh, translation, anterior, posterior, pretty close. And as you can see here, uh, definitely less in the rotations on all planes. Stick tight coating provides superior initial stability. Biologic fixation is as good uh, or potentially even better than conventional pores coating with the potential for improved performance under challenging conditions and uh, less reliance on adjunctive fixation such as screws for your initial stability with your high coefficient of friction. So this will segue and, uh, into REDAPT technology. Here's an example of a REDAPT revision shell. Um, I've implanted a few of these, these cups, these implants, and I've been very impressed and very happy with how they're performing. So the material composition is different than that of stick tight. Uh, it's a titanium alloy uh, with the name Consolock. It's made from titanium, uh, aluminum, uh, vitalium, and meets the ASTM and ISO standards for that alloy. Shown to be biocompatible, has a good clinical history over 40 years, uh, 40 years of use in medical devices, so that's important to know. The porosity is up to 80%, so matching that of uh, tantalum. It has an interconnected network of pores, pores with the porosity up to 80%, and uh, where the initial fixation uh, in the near surface regions where the initial fixation will occur, overall porosity up to 67%. So these are similar to uh, other advanced pore structures that are currently on the market with a range of 60 to 80%. Again, this is a 67% overall porosity for Consolock. Here's what it looks like under uh, electric, uh, electron magnification. Pore size, 
Studies show that pore size greater than uh, 100 micrometers benefit biologic fixation. The pore size for a consolock is 202 microns at 934 microns. Has an average pore size ranges from 202 to 342 uh, overall, and uh, 484 to 934 at the surfaces of the pore structure. So, this is what separates uh, this from standard uh, uh, trabecular metal revision shells. You have your variable locking screw technology. So, for bone ingrowth to occur, you want to make sure that your implant is stable. Reported that uh, as little as 150 microns of motion can impede the process of bone ingrowth. So having this adjunct of variable locking screw technology is really advantageous in the, in the revision setting. Thank you. Now I would like to invite Dr. Neeraj Agrawal to speak on the role of ortholine in joint replacement surgery. Uh, thank you, organizers. So, uh, yes, we all know that uh, knee arthroplasty is a successful procedure. And we already have 15-year results from different institutes in all in all uh, uh, conferences as well as papers which have been presented. Whenever someone asks about uh, successful knee replacement, it's very difficult to give a single answer that, okay, you do this step good and you will get a good result. Rather, it has to be good. You do a good surgery and you don't close it well, it's a problem. You don't cement it well, it's a problem. So out of all these successful steps to make a total knee replacement, one important step is to get a good alignment for which you need to have a good uh, soft tissue balance as well as bone cuts. And to get a good bone cuts, uh, there are different ways of getting it which we will discuss. Right now, the modern research in arthroplasty is more based on how to get either a good alignment or good pain control or tribology. The reason are clear that many issues in arthroplasty are solved, but few things which actually will either make the patients overall uh, increase their comfort zone to get the surgery is pain control or increase the longevity of the arthroplasty is tribology as well as alignment. Out of which we will discuss about the alignment issue. The alignment whenever we speak is actually coronal, sagittal or rotational alignment. Means to get a good surgery done, it is important to get a good coronal alignment, it is important to get a sagittal alignment as well as rotational alignment done. All three should be perfect, then only your surgery will be good. You do one thing good and the other is not good, then the surgery will not be good. And what decides the alignment? Well, in if you ask me in a single uh, sentence definition, so a axis from center of hip to center of ankle should pass through center of the knee. If you get this, then you have good coronal alignment. Rotational as well as sagittal alignment require a different use. So a normal knee, if you see from center of axis of the body, not the, uh, not the limb itself, then 
the femur is in about 9 degree of valgus and tibia is in about 3 degree of varus. So the combinedly we have 6 degrees of valgus in a lower limb. And how to get this? To have to get good bone cuts and to get these bone cuts, which are these bone cuts? One is distal femoral, either proximal tibial or anteroposterior femoral cut. So if you get these three cuts right, then you will get a good alignment. It includes the slope of these cuts also, not only the coronal cuts. And so what we used to do, we used to use the different type of jigs. Very uh, different companies have different type of jigs. Few were very fancy jigs, few were uh, not as fancy, but the idea was to get a reproducible alignment. And then what was done later on, that to get a still, if the jigs were working well, then this research in orthopedics probably have come to a halt. But it was seen that even with the jigs, there was always a rep error which could not be corrected and unforeseen error. Generally, what is accepted is plus minus three degrees of varus or valgus, or you can say change in the alignment, but there are many outliers. And to reduce these outliers in alignment, we require something else which is known as computer navigation. So computer navigation came in the scene to get to make the alignment precise. It is a tool which helps you to operate better, but your surgical technique always is more important. And so there are many computer navigations which have been launched in last 20 years. There were definitely many advantages as well as disadvantages for these uh, navigation uh, systems. They were infrared systems, they are optical, visual, and other many different type of computer navigations were there. They had many advantages to improve the alignment, and but they had some disadvantages. That was that either it's a very expensive capital equipment. Uh, number one, it requires a lot of money you have to spend. You have to give a significant space and manpower in the OT. It changes the surgeon's workflow because if navigation is in front of you, then someone cannot stand right in front of you. Definitely, it increases the surgical time, steps, as well as learning curve. And still, it's not a standard of care in knee replacement. So there were many advantages, but the disadvantages I have just enumerated. And as the technology always improves, so all these telephones were good, but if you see that the progress, as we have progressed further and further, we have got a better mobiles every time, and they are more powerful, they are more having more backup and facilities. Similarly, it has gone like this. So middle is the computer navigation, which is a machine which has occupied more than 100 OTs in India. And then it came the ortho line, which is a palm held uh, device, which is a sensor based machine. If you see the results of computer assisted as well as conventional TK, there are no difference in the functional recovery of the patients operated by both, but alignment definitely better. X-ray alignment is definitely better with CS, which probably will change in long term, long term longevity of the implant, but difficult to say right now. So uh, navigated, uh, this, uh, this is a graphical representation where non-navigated knees have 74% chances that they will fall in the right alignment, while for na uh, computer navigated knees, 95% will fall in the good alignment. Then, come, then after this navigation was launched, there came the pinless navigation, where the actually the uh, it decreased the it decreases the operative time, blood loss, as well as there were no pin tract issues which were seen with traditional navigation. So, pin track, pinless navigation came, and then came the device which is known as an ortho align. So it has again two modules, one is attached to the instrument, other is attached to the bones, and it's a form of wireless communication. The technology actually supports many orthopedic applications. In fact, it's there in all the aircraft, which uh, has two sensors, as accelerometers as well as gyroscopes, which helps in a linear as well as angular acceleration and change in the rate of acceleration is depicted by this. So this is a very small device which helps in doing a precise surgery, which helps, which doesn't require any precise pre-operative planning and doesn't recept the surgical outflow. 
so uh, definitely this is a very important and tool in your hand if you can use it regularly to get a very good alignment with her, without disrupting your workflow without putting a extra investment one single time investment and can work with any implant any uh, and any surgeon can use it with a very short learning curve so uh, definitely alignments good alignment helps in doing surgeries and especially these cases where there are extra articular deformities and the internal jigs are not usable in these surgeries this is a definitely a technology of choice you can see this x ray you can see this one more x ray so navigation helps to improve the leg axis leg axis and femoral rotation uh, definitely we cannot say that functional early recovery is better but long term results have to be awaited and seen and uh, these smaller applications these smaller instruments have better make it better surgeon friendly and uh, probably long term results are yet to be seen how the things will go i appreciate your attention thank you Uh, thank you, Dr. Agrawal, for this wonderful topic on North Line. Uh, so, thank you everyone for attending this workshop. Uh, we, uh, it's uh, our workshop for today is over. So, see you at gala dinner. Thank you, everyone.